Hi everyone and in today's video we'll be discussing about the skeletal muscle contraction which is also known as the excitation contraction coupling. Now why is it called so? The reason is that this involves two processes. The first one is excitation which occurs at the level of the neuromuscular junction whereas then we have which is followed by the contraction which occurs at the level of skeletal muscle fibers. So now let's look at the basic structure of skeletal muscle. So here we have the muscle fiber which is actually made up of one thousand or more myofibrils consisting of actin and myosin filaments and these muscle fibers they are surrounded by an entomycium layer and several of these muscle fibers they are bundled together into a fascicle which is lined by the perimysium so that is how the structure looks like and several of these muscle fascicles they form a skeletal muscle which is covered on the outside by the epimysium so these are the layers which form a skeletal muscle Having said this basic anatomy, we now move into the neuromuscular junction and through neuromuscular junction we will speak about the part of excitation. So it is at the neuromuscular junction where excitation occurs. There is also an additional system which we will discuss about which is the part of the which is involved in the muscular region that is the sarcotubular system. So as the name suggests, the sarcotubular system consists of two parts. The first one is the sarcolemma which is the one which is shown here in the violet color and then we have the tubules which is this structure which are the invaginations of the sarcolemma actually sorry it's not sarcolemma it's actually sarcoplasmic reticulum sarcolemma is the plasma membrane of a skeletal muscle cell whereas sarcoplasmic reticulum is the endoplasmic reticulum of myo muscle fibers so in this case this structure here is the sarcoplasmic reticulum whereas the t-shaped structure here is known as the t-tubules so these are actually the t-shaped invaginations of sarcolemma or the plasma membrane of muscle fibers so that's the muscular part of neuromuscular junction when we come to the nerve ending here we have the axon with the myelin sheath and at the end nerve ending what happens is that the nerve fibers becomes unmyelinated and at the synaptic junction at this region what happens is that when the action potential reaches the nerve ending here we have the calcium molecules the calcium channels open and there will be an influx of calcium molecules at the nerve endings or at the synaptic region and this calcium molecule they causes these vesicles containing acetylcholine to undergo exocytosis what it means is that these acetylcholine vesicles will release their acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft or into the synapse now the muscle fiber present here it has indentations at the region of neuromuscular junction and this segment of the muscle fiber is known as the motor end plate what it does is that with the release of the acetylcholine molecules these acetylcholine molecules they will bind to the ligands or the ACH ligands and the ACH ligands will produce an end plate potential and this end plate potential what it does is that it will increase and with the increase of the end plate potential there will be sodium channels on the muscle cells which get open or activated sodium channels get activated and that will lead to the excitation of the muscle and this excitation will be then transmitted through the sarcolemma through the sarcolemma into the t-tubules and the excitation what does it do this excitation in the t-tubules there are these receptors called as dhpr receptors these dhpr receptors they get activated they in turn they are very co closely connected to the sarcotubular system where the t-tubules are closely connected to the sarcoplasmic reticulum so this reticulum contains the ryanodine receptors and this ryanodine receptors get activated and what do they do when the ryanodine receptors are activated the calcium molecules which are stored inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum they get released into the muscle cell or inside the cytoplasm what it means is that now we have the calcium molecule which is which has been released into the cytoplasm and then we move on to the part of contraction so this is what are the events which are actually happening at the level of excitation so if we are to write those events down it all begins with the neuromuscular junction where the action potential reaches the nerve ending when the action potential reaches the nerve ending what happens is that the calcium channels at the nerve ending open and when the calcium channels open they will cause the exocytosis or the release of ACH into the uh, synaptic cleft once the acetylcholine molecules are released they bind to their ligands 
so ACH bind to its ligands which leads to the generation of end plate potential is generated and the end plate potential will then lead to the opening of voltage gated sodium uh, not voltage gated but it will lead to the opening of uh, sodium channels and with the opening of sodium channels an action potential is generated in the skeletal muscles which is transmitted into the sarcotubular system and with the sarcotubular system what happens is that the dhpr receptors of the t tubules get activated and they will activate further another receptor that is the rhinodine receptor of this sarcoplasmic reticulum and that will release the calcium into the cytoplasm so this is a cluster of events which occurs at the level of excitation now the calcium must act on to the actin and myosin filaments which are the myofibrins to cause contraction of the muscle so i hope that's clear now we move on to the part of contraction where we have the skeletal muscle structure which we have to discuss next what we have drawn here is a typical skeletal muscle structure the one which is shown here in maroon is the actin filament or the i band it's not just actin but in we can say it as the i band or the thin band it consists in addition to actin there is troponin and there is tropomyosin as well so these three structures constitute the i band or the thin band then we have here the thick band the thick band is called as the a band and it is made up of myosin so that is about the my myofibrins now we need to know some technical terms so the distance between these two regions that is it consists of half of i band plus the whole of a band plus the half of another i band this distance is called as the sacromere now this is the functional unit of a muscle a sacromere is said to be a functional unit of a muscle because contraction occurs at the level of sacromere when muscle contracts what happens is that the length of the sacromere tends to decrease now what we need to know about muscle contraction is that the i bands are always constant when a muscle contracts whereas sorry the a bands are always constant when a muscle contracts whereas it is the i bands which reduce in size during muscle contraction so contraction occurs at the level of i band and why does that happen that is what we will be discussing next in addition to that one term which we need to know is this region called as the h zone now what is the speciality of h zone it is that region where the i bands do not overlap the a band in other regions as we can see there is an overlap between the i bands and the a bands right whereas at the h zone there is no overlap between the i bands and a bands and only a band is present so that's just a basic outlook or a structure of a skeletal muscle or the myofibril arrangement and now if we move on to the actual processes which take place during contraction now before the contraction begins what happens before the contraction begin what happens here is that we have the structure here this is our myosin which forms the a band and this part is the i band and it consists of the structure called as actin and then we have the spirally shaped tropomyosin and on top of it we have troponins now before contraction what usually happens is that the tropomyosin will prevent the binding between actin and myosin so what we can write down is that tropomyosin will inhibit the binding of actin with myosin for contraction to occur one of the first steps is that actin must bind with myosin and the myosin head is pulled inwards so that is what happens during a contraction for contraction to begin what happens is that the first step is that an atp molecule will bind to the myosin head and this atp molecule will get converted into or hydrolyzed into adp plus inorganic phosphate so these two molecules get adhered into the head of myosin and then what happens is that by the hydrolysis of atp the uh, myosin adopts a more perpendicular position that is the head of the myosin remains in a perpendicular position and following this what happens is that the action potential will reach the myofibrins and when the action potential reaches the myofibrins what happens is that we know that calcium is released 
and this calcium will bind into the subunit of troponin called as troponin C. So troponin C is a subunit of troponin which binds to calcium. By the binding of calcium with troponin C, what happens is that there is a conformational change which occurs in tropomyosin and because of that what happens is that tropomyosin changes its shape and this change in shape of tropomyosin will expose the binding site of myosin on the actin. So now we have the binding side which is open and by this what happens is that now the myosin can finally bind to actin to initiate contraction and this is what happens that is by the exposure what happens is that the myosin head which has the ATP and inorganic phosphate attached to it which is in a perpendicular position will now bind to the actin and then it initiates the contraction what happens is that this region of myosin which is called as the arm and this part which is called as the head what happens is that the head will tilt towards the arm side and that will lead to contraction and it will pull the actin filaments along that direction and that is what is responsible for the contraction of the muscle. This movement of myosin is called as the power stroke and during power stroke what happens is that the ATP and the, the ADP and the inorganic phos phosphate molecule which was earlier present in the head of myosin will be released outside as separate molecules. So ADP plus inorganic phosphate will be released and the muscle undergoes contraction with the power stroke. And how does this end? Well, this ends when a new molecule of ATP binds to the myosin. And when that happens, what happens is that the detachment of myosin head from the actin occurs. And the step is repeated where myosin will cleave ATP into ADP and inorganic phosphate and the cycle continues. So these are the events which take place during contraction phase of the excitation contraction coupling. Now the question is what happens during relaxation or how does the muscle contraction end? For the relaxation to occur we have to go back to the previous figure and we have to realize that the calcium that is present in the cytoplasm they must enter back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum and for this what happens is that there is a receptor which is present in the sarcoplasmic reticulum and this receptor is called as circa it is known by the name circa and the circa receptor what happens is that it will actively pump all the calcium molecules which is present in the cytoplasm back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum what happens by that which means that now the calcium goes back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum when the calcium goes back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum what happens is that calcium is released from our troponin molecule where we had said that calcium binds to the troponin c and this means that the tropomyosin will uh, go back to its earlier state and it will prevent or inhibit the binding of myosin with actin and this causes the detachment of myosin from actin leading to relaxation of muscle. So these are the events which occur in excitation contraction coupling. Another note for a clinical importance of this area is a disease called as myasthenia gravis. Now what happens in myasthenia gravis is that at the neuromuscular junction we have drawn the nerve earlier. This is the nerve and this is our muscle or the motor end plate. We have the ACH receptors right or the ACH ligands. What happens is that there are going to be antibodies which are produced against the acetylcholine receptors. What happens is that these antibodies will prevent the binding of ACH with acetylcholine ligand. So what happens is that as a consequence of these antibodies, there is going to be less muscle stimulation or skeletal muscle stimulation. And because of that, the person will experience easy fatigability. This is the pathophysiology which occurs in myasthenia gravis that is antibodies to ACH ligands leads to decreased muscle stimulation leading to easy fatig fatigability and it is most commonly the presentation occurs at the extraocular muscles of the eye. So that is a point which we need to know about myasthenia gravis and I guess that's about excitation contraction coupling. Mm -hmm.